In November 1918, the Great War had finally ended. Four years of death and destruction in Europe had cost 23 million casualties to military and civilian personnel throughout the world. Despite the belief that it would be the war to end all wars, there was another and bloodier war 20 years down the line, and the Eastern Front was to have some of the largest and most catastrophic battles in the world. By August 1939, the German Reich under Adolf Hitler had torn apart the humiliating Treaty of Versailles. The victorious powers had forced this upon the German people after World War I. Austria, Czech and Lithuania had all felt the pressure of Hitler's ambition and had folded territory into the Reich. Now it was the time of Poland. After the defeat of the German Empire in 1918 and the revolution in Germany, Poland had been born out of the Russian-held lands and the German ones. Germany, although holding on to Königsberg in East Prussia, had lost Danzig and the west of Prussia, cutting Königsberg off from the rest of Germany. The Weimar Republic had long wished to reassert dominance over the regions, but the Nazis were not afraid of the actions and thoughts of the international community. Hitler's real enemy, however, was the Soviet Union, yet in 1939 Rippentrop had pulled an excellent piece of diplomacy and signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union's Foreign Minister, Molotov. This pact between the two powers would allow the German army not to be drawn into a two-front war like they had been in World War I. Up until this point, Hitler and the German Reich had been somewhat attempting to diplomatically have Danzig and West Prussia returned. In 1937, Germany proposed the idea of an extraterritorial railroad through the Polish corridor, yet the Poles rejected the idea due to a fear of losing their independence over time. And by April 1939, all talks had broken down. On the morning of the 1st of September 1939, the order was given to German forces off the border to cross and attack Poland. The disorganised Polish forces were no match for the German troops. The German forces were split into two army groups. Army Group North were under the command of Fedor von Bock with the 4th and 3rd Army. In the South, Army Group South were under the command of Gerd von Hunstedt with the 8th, 10th and 14th Army under his command. The Polish forces on the other side were organised more regionally with armies around the various cities in the west with mobilised divisions from towns around Poland. The Polish army, while having some tanks, had nothing like the numbers of the Germans. The Wehrmacht was using around 2,500 tanks during this campaign. The Germans also had air superiority around Poland with the Luftwaffe using over 2,000 aircraft. The effects of the Luftwaffe helped to soften the position of the Poles. The Germans used the aircraft such as Ju-87 and Heikel 111s in coordination with tank rushes. The German armour would push through the lines of the Poles while infantry followed close behind to support and capture strategic locations. Many would go on to call this tactic Blitzkrieg or Lightning War, yet this is misleading. Guderian himself claimed that the term was coined by the Allies as a way to explain the speed and success of the German offensive. Another key misconception to be cleared up here is the use of cavalry. There are tales of German tanks going up against Polish lancers. These tales perhaps have a founding in an actual cavalry charge of the Poles, in the late afternoon of the first day of the invasion, some Polish cavalry, who were normally dismounted and attacked with their rifles, were sent to flank the German forces that had pushed hard towards Kronjanty. I'll apologise now for any pronunciations I get wrong throughout this video, I'm not particularly familiar with Eastern European pronunciation. Once they came across the Germans, they were ordered to charge during how, due to having the element of surprise as they appeared out of the forest. They did this with some success. However, at the same time, German armoured cars of the 20th Motorized Division appeared and fired upon the cavalry. Two days later, the 19th Corps of the Germans, under the command of Guderian, had surrounded Polish troops, which included the Pomorska Cavalry Brigade, and in an attempt to break out, they dashed between the tanks, which to some would indeed look like an attempt to attack them. Yet one thing that is consistent is the defeat of Poland, yet even this is misrepresented in many documentaries and pop culture. The Poles had caused massive damage to the German forces in the first few days of the war. The actual Polish campaign only lasted a week less than a campaign in France, despite being more equal in numbers and better equipment on the French side. The Poles had what they called the Romanian Bridgehead Plan. This was the idea that the Polish army east of the Vistula was to fall back to the natural defences around Lvov and hold out until the winter and wait for the French promised offensive. However, the Soviet invasion changed the plan completely, and soon the Polish defence broke down. 6th of October, the last re remaining Polish forces surrendered, 
however Poland themselves did not formally surrender to the German Reich. The Poles were split between the Nazis and the Soviets and thus began some of the worst occupation in the history of mankind. After the fall of France, the attention of the Germans once again turned to the East, this time to the forces of the Soviet Union. The molotov top Pact had given Hitler and the Nazis almost free reign through Europe. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, had not been in the best shape. Stalin had been afraid of the return of Trotsky and thus purged his military over the years previous to the war in Poland. Initially, many believed that almost 50% of the Red Army was purged, but in fact, it is realised that only 3.7 to 7.7% of the army was actually purged. But this still caused the Russians issues with the war with Finland, causing them massive casualties. Hitler saw that the Soviet Union in the East as the true ideological enemy. From day one of his campaigning in Germany had been very anti-communist. As already discussed, the molotov ribbentrop Pact allowed free reign in Europe, and by March 1941 there were already 680,000 German troops on the border with the Soviet Union. The date that was set for the invasion of the Soviet Union was the 15th of May. However, this date was pushed back for various reasons, and there is some debated within modern historians on exactly why it was delayed. Theories from issues with logistics and the problems of the Balkans are all given. By the time of Operation Barbarossa there were 153 divisions deployed on the German side, including 19 panzer divisions. The German army was split into three army groups and a separate army called Army Norway. The Soviets were not unprepared as some believe. Even by 1940 the Soviet Union was making plans to counter a German offensive with the main push expected to come from north of the Pyramid Marshes which was the German plan in 1941. However, in October 1940, Stalin ordered more defences to be made to the south of the marshes towards the Ukraine. And in early 1941, Stalin ordered through the Defensive Plan 1941 and then Mobilisation Plan 1941, which called for the deployment of 186 divisions in the four military districts facing the German Reich in a first echelon of defence. Then, a second echelon with only around 50 divisions in the second line of defences would be formed. However, the Soviets only got to deploy 170 divisions to this first line of defence, yet the second line contained 57. But despite this, many were under strength. The Soviets also had around 10,000 tanks ready for combat at this time too. Yet, on the 22nd of June 1941, at 0315 hours, the Axis powers attacked the Soviet Union with air bombing raid and artillery bombardments. The initial attack rocked the Soviet command from the lowest levels to the highest. Within six hours of the invasion, Stalin ordered a general counterattack, yet he did not have a grasp of the dire situation his forces were in. Yet, commanders did not argue against him due to fear of retribution. The Luftwaffe also at this time targeted Soviet airfields and strategic locations and attacked them in the early morning, knocking out much of the early response of the Red Air Force. Yet, despite gaining early air superiority, as the front spread out, it became harder for the Luftwaffe to apply the superiority. Army Group North, or Heer's Group Nord, quickly broke through the Soviet 8th and 11th Army in the Baltic States. This led to a counterattack staged by the Soviets on the next day at Rasenanaye. Here, elements of the 4th Panzer Group clashed with the forces of the 3rd Mechanized Corps of the Soviets. The Soviets were equipped with mostly BT-7s and T-26s. However, there were some KV-1 and KV-2s mixed amongst the Soviet tanks, the first time the Germans would come up against them. And a single KV-2, or perhaps a KV-1 depending on the sources you read, pushed deep into the lines of the Wehrmacht, holding off Panzer 38Ts and 50mm anti-tank guns, and knocking out a Black 88 before it could fire a shot into the tank. The Soviet tank was finally destroyed by engineers putting grenades through holes that had been caused by 50mm anti-tank guns. On the 25th, the Soviet forces were ordered to pull back to Davinia, yet Manstein and his forces got to the river and established a bridgehead first. The Soviets then pulled back to the Stalin Line, a line of fortifications meant to defend against attacks from the west. However, the Stalin Line had been disregarded and was due for an upgrade, and many of the guns in the fortified positions had been taken out. The Army Group North, however, pushed against this Stalin Line, and on the 8th of July, Sykov had fallen and Army Group North had reached the Leningrad Oblast and was only 250 kilometers away from its target of Leningrad. In the south, where the Wehrmacht was to face the large concentration of forces, the Soviets had similar issues. The 1st Panzer Army pushed through the initial borders and while the terrain allowed the Soviets better time to plan their defensive, the Soviet counter-attack was poorly organized. This allowed the numerically superior Soviet forces to be crushed as they attacked them piecemeal rather than all together. Once again, 
The lack of organisation led to German forces to push through the Soviet defences. Army Group Centre also made massive pushes against the Soviet lines. The initial push was extremely successful, as per being led by the Panzer forces. The Soviet forces attempted another counterattack against the Panzer forces. However, the 3rd Panzer Group, which was the target of the Soviets, had moved on and pushed onwards to Minsk. Therefore, the Soviet Mechanized Corps met with infantry resistance with AT weapons and air support. The Soviets were then defeated. However, the 3rd and 2nd Panzer Corps captured Minsk on the 28th and this led to two massive encirclements. The Germans destroyed the Soviet 3rd and 10th Armies while inflicting serious losses on the 4th, 11th and 13th Armies. And they were reported to have captured 324,000 Soviet troops, 3,300 tanks and 1,800 artillery pieces. From the 2nd of July, rain slowed the Army Group Centre down and this slowdown allowed for the organisation of a huge Soviet counterattack to be prepared. Army Group Center had the objective of Somensk. Capturing this would open the road to Moscow. Yet standing in their way were six Soviet armies, and on the 6th there was a massive counterattack from the 5th and 7th Mechanized Corps of the 20th Army. The Soviets clashed with the 39th and 47th Panzer Corps and lost over 800 tanks of the 2,000 they had to use. The Luftwaffe's only real tank buster squadron were in the area and massively assisted German Panzer forces. With the counterattack defeated, Army Group Center attempted yet another encirclement with Solmansk as the center point. The encirclement was almost complete when the 29th Panzer Division captured Smolensk on the 16th of July. However, the gap wasn't finally closed until the 5th of August, and this led to over 300,000 Red Army troops to be captured. Yet many more escaped and offered resistance to the German forces on the way to Moscow. It was at this point that the German High Command noticed how much they had underestimated the Soviet forces. Before the war, Hitler had said, we only have to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. The Red Army, however, had offered massive resistance to the German army and despite failures of the counterattacks, they had helped use up much of the German forces supplies. But therefore, within the first four weeks, the Germans had used up their initial supplies and the German forces now changed their tactics from aggressive attacks to slower, more coordinated pushes to allow for the supplies to catch up. One of the issues for the supply was the difference in the rail gauges of the German and Soviet train tracks. Hitler, however, had lost faith in the encirclement tactics that had been employed up until this point, and believed that he could defeat the Soviets through economic means, and thus switched to capture the important cities of Leningrad, Kharkov, the Donbass, and the Baku oil fields in the Caucasus. Chief of the OKH, General Franz Halder and von Bock wished to continue the push to Moscow, yet Hitler bypassed their commands and ordered the tanks of Army Group Center to assist Army Group North and Army Group South. Guderian, who was sent by the generals to convince the Fuhrer of their plan to attack Moscow, came back on the side of Hitler, earning hatred from his fellow officers. Yet Moscow was still close to the German lines and thus would still become an objective. Despite the issues with supply and the disagreements within the German High Command, the German forces were still pushing forward. By mid-July, German forces had pushed a few kilometers of Kiev in the south, and the 1st Panzer Group then struck south while the 17th Army attacked eastward. This push captured three more Soviet armies around Uman. As this pocket was crushed, the 2nd Panzer Group moved away from Army Group Center, crossed the Desna River, and with the 2nd Army on its right flank, joined with the 1st Panzer Group and trapped another four armies. In the north, the 4th Panzer Group had been reinforced with tanks from Army Group Center, and with these reinforcements, they attacked the Soviet defenses around Leningrad. With the push from the Finns in the north and the capture of Lake Lagoda, the city was put into siege. Within the first three months of the siege from August to November, the city dug in, with over 400,000 civilians working on defense works and 160,000 joining the Red Army. The Soviet Great Patriotic War was seen at its best in Leningrad. On the 9th of September, Hitler had ordered the taking of Leningrad with no prisoners, yet a high amount of German casualties frustrated Hitler and he called off the assault and resumed the siege. The final target of the German offensive was Kiev. The encirclement of the Soviet forces in Kiev was achieved on the 16th of September. A battle ensued in which the Soviets were hammered with tanks, artillery and aerial bombardment. And after 10 days of vicious fighting, the Germans claimed 665,000 Soviet soldiers captured although the real figure is probably only around 220,000 prisoners. The Germans in this pocket had defeated 452,000 men. The German forces, however, did not fare too much better, and some units were down to 25% effectiveness up until this point in Barbarossa. However, with these successes, the German forces were ready for Operation Typhoon, the assault on Moscow. 
Thank you very much for watching the first part of the Eastern Front, uh, History Through Games Eastern Front. There are several more parts to come. This will be a series that I'm doing now until we get to the end of the war with the fall of Berlin. Um, if you guys have enjoyed this, please like, share and subscribe. And if you subscribe, click on the little bell button so you can be part of what people like to call the notification squads. This way you get notifications whenever my videos come out. If you really enjoyed the video, um, we do have a Patreon which can support me to make more videos and you know get better equipment and things like that. Again, I'd like to thank Keegs for providing us with Men of War 2, which is a lot of the footage has come from here. would also like to thank Charlie Zulu and uh, the guys who helped me out uh, filming the War Thunder stuff. In primarily, check out Cerberus Finn. He also has a YouTube channel himself where he does a load of War Thunder stuff. So thank you very much, Cerberus, for helping out as well. So, yes, this has been Lozy. This has been History of Games. This has been part one of the Eastern Front.